Because your brothers and with Everton with Jay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But you know, no. this is don't make me gavel. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody, I'm going to call the special joint meeting of the City Council and the Finance Advisory Committee to order. Uh, roll call, please. Morris. Here. Carson. Here. Smith. Perkins. Here. McAdams. Verbeck. Here. Faber. Mayor Barnes. Here. Five present. And Smith, McAdams, and Faber reached out ahead of time, letting us know they wouldn't be able to be here. Um, go ahead. Miss Scott, would you please call the roll for us? Thank you. Babcock? Here. Briscoe? Here. McGill? Neely? Here. Parch? Here. Tierzinski? Here. Washington? Five present. Awesome. Moving on to agenda item C, public participation. Is there anyone from the public that would like to comment? Nope. <laughs> All right, moving on to agenda item D, <laughs> consideration of the proposed FY 2023 budget. Can, it's a consider, can I have a motion to bring it to the floor? So moved. Second. Moved by Alderman Verbeck, seconded by Alderwoman Morris. That's all we need. No roll call, right? Beautiful. All right, city manager, you want to kick us off? I do. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. Good evening. <coughs> For uh, the Finance Advisory Committee, this is a, your third uh, chance to uh, talk about some of the essentials of the city's annual budget. Uh, for the council, this is your second time. <clears throat> um, and so uh, in the past, what, what I've done as uh, sort of a leader of the discussion is to take us through, and we're all flipping pages, flipping pages, flipping pages, uh, which we may end up doing. It's your pleasure. But uh, what I'd like to do is take this section by section and go deeper if you so choose. And if not, uh, we move to the next section. And uh, if that's agreeable to you, I'll get going. Sounds great. All right. So uh, a few uh, advertisements or commercial statements here. Uh, this uh, budget, as you might guess, is, is not this, just uh, the work of a person sitting at the corner in the corner office at uh, City Hall. It's uh, it's the work of many hands, uh, some of which you see in the room here tonight. Uh, I'm, I'm particularly uh, grateful for the assistance of Carrie Dittman, our new finance director. Uh, uh, those of you who have been around here for a while know that uh, since February of 2019, we haven't had a full-time uh, finance director, and we achieved that goal in January of this year. And Carrie has been uh, exceptional in her assistance and in the work that she's, she's provided. And some of the work that uh, she's provided is evident in your budget. Um, there are uh, some more, there's more attention given to um, uh, projections, uh, comparisons, metrics. And we'll get better as we go along, but in the time that we had, and this is a process that begins in earnest in June, and uh, at this point is wrapping up five months later. So it's, it's, a, it's an abiding responsibility of many people, but again, Jerry, I, I appreciate your time. Uh, Ruth Scott, uh, your time for uh, coordinating meetings and uh, keeping yours truly sort of uh, on an even keel <laughs> through all this process. And uh, department heads, uh, all of you know your departments best. And we've had many individual meetings and some joint meetings to talk about uh, where we need to be, what we need in the way of operational requirements for personnel and so forth. So uh, I, again, thank you. Uh, the, the budget document that you have before you, and I think everybody has a hard copy, and, and you're aware that it's been up on the city's website and posted for uh, some time now, uh, begins with a transmittal letter. And that's my opportunity to try to speak, not to you necessarily, but to residents and businesses of the city of DeKalb, or anybody who goes on our internet and is looking, well, what kind of serve, what's this place like? Um, 
what are the priorities, what are the, what are the principal occupations uh, of the people that serve uh, in, in city government? And so that was my objective, and it can be judged in, in that sense. We've talked about this before. Uh, we're here to serve. Uh, we're not here just to do our business and hope that people like it. Uh, but we have to be responsive, and we have to be, I think, in the budget, particularly transparent and also very readable so that the widest possible audience that may not have a background in finance or accountancy can understand what we're doing. So there's a lot of pictures, there are a lot of graphs and charts, and quite a lot of narrative here to try to spell out in a very general way what it is that tax dollars, local and state and federal, are, are doing to help us achieve these services. So with that said, uh, the transmittal uh, goes into some detail uh, on the general fund and also, as we talked about in October with the Finance Advisory Committee, a couple of our key capital funds, also the water fund. So that should not be a surprise to the Finance Advisory Committee. Uh, I, I hope if you have any questions, just please interrupt me at any time, uh, members of the council. Uh, a couple of things have changed, but not much. Uh, one thing is that right after the October 19th, within a week of the October 19th meeting with the Finance Advisory Committee, we got uh, another estimate from DeKalb County about what our EAV might be. And at that point, we were shooting around 768500000 give or take a couple bucks. And uh, our new estimate that we have in the budget uh, for calculation of of uh, ultimately by every individual uh, property taxpayer there, what their obligation is going to be is 780 million. And that was what we thought was a, a good stopping point until about a week ago when this is already decked out and, and on the way toward you. Uh, we got the uh, scent of some additional EAV, but that's probably preferable to my talking. <laughs> uh, but in, uh, showing an abundance of caution, I'm not, I'm not presenting that to you tonight. Why? Uh, so far this year, interestingly, because the multiplier is going to be 6.62% for residents and businesses in DeKalb County, everybody is going to see an increase in their property unless they appeal. And the appeals have been significant and abundant to this point. I get a copy through um, Ruth's office of every appeal that comes for the city, the city government taxes or uh, obligation in particular. So uh, there are a couple large um, firms. I, I don't want to be specific, but you can probably guess that are in the South uh, Industrial Park, the Chicago West Business Park, that um, have just received their notices since there's new assessed valuations now coming to them for the first time. And um, the projected EAV is so enormous. If we overstate where we're going to be, we'll be surprising a lot of people. So my, my uh, recommendation th through the various pages in the budget is that we stick at $780 million. That's a very significant increase. It also has an impact on what we project to be the um, obligation that will be faced by the average homeowner. I don't know what that is. We've been using a, uh, a house. We could have started at $150,000. We went a little higher than that, $300,000, so an EAV of 100000 to start about four years ago when we started this little exercise. You have a copy at your seat. Looks like this. And with a levy that the Finance Advisory Committee recommended and which the Council has also supported and which is in the um, ordinance that will be heard on first reading a week from tonight of 7119000 and change, um, the city's rate uh, 
accounting for the, the multiplier would be 0.91271. Uh, the library rate is not so significant to anybody tonight. That's not what we're talking about, but th this is a, a presentation we made last week. Um, if we were to keep the same rate as last year, which was uh, 0.98612, the impact on the individual homeowner would be more significant in terms of out-of-pocket taxes paid. What we have in the budget would actually amount to a savings of about 10 bucks for that, that uh, large house. Uh, for um, if, if we were just a flat line, the rate from last year, and we talked about this a little bit at the last FAC meeting, uh, the, the average homeowner, according to this example, would be paying 70 bucks out-of-pocket. So. Um, just so you know, and the council's talked about this many times in, in this room in the last six months, um, the mayor intends to send out a call basically to uh, the principal elected and appointed officials in each of the local taxing bodies for a meeting sometime in January. We've kind of missed this wave now, but uh, for next year to get ahead of things so that they can all participate in what they think our targeted collective or aggregate rate ought to be for our community. And it would be hard to lead that conversation if our out-of-pocket taxes for, the, for our uh, services would go up. Mayor, did you want to? No, you're absolutely right. Uh, and the reason we want to get the letter out now, um, obviously they're going to decide on their levies uh, before our January meeting, but trying to get all the taxing bodies together have this conversation is impractical before they're actually going to do their truth in taxation um, and establish what their rates are going to be. My hope is putting this out in front of them is going to at least get them to question where our rates at, look at what the city of DeKalb is doing, and hopefully follow our lead in greatly trying to reduce our tax rate from 11.1 .1 right now down to 9.6 in the next two, three years. So that's what that meeting in January is going to be about. Hopefully this letter is going to trigger some taxing bodies, if not all of them, because when you look at the amount of EAV that has come in, I think it's every taxing body's responsibility to finally, finally give back to the taxpayer, and they can do that in form of a reduction of the tax rate. And their levies will still go up in the process. I will say, uh, interestingly, just by coincidence for our talk tonight, uh, there was a DeKalb County EDC meeting today. It's executive committee, uh, representatives of all local tax bodies that are there, basically. And uh, I, I'm very pleased to say that uh, the county administrator uh, spoke exactly what you're saying, what I've been saying. Uh, and, and I talked to him after the meeting, and he said he would be delighted to show up. And it looks like their out-of-pocket tax portion is going to go down this year. Uh, no small... Uh, part because of the um, tremendous increases in EAV in the business parks in the south side of town. So uh, he was complimentary to the city and also urged everybody to take this seriously. This is a transformative moment for the city of DeKalb. Now, we have some structural problems, which I'll get to shortly, uh, that are unique to us and for us to solve. But this is something we can only solve with the participation and the support of the other taxing bodies. If we're going to lower one of the five key factors in uh, attracting new business, and, and for that matter, uh, new families, uh, people who are coming here to start uh, a new life, and, and the rest. Okay. All right, let's yeah, dive in. Before yes. Before you continue, I just wanted to point out um, for those of you at the FAC meeting that we had in October, you saw a presentation that looks like this that was based on the original uh, estimated EAV of the $768,500,000 that Bill was referring to. That's the back page, um, and that was what was put in the transmittal letter. The top page shows the new $780 million EAV. So the items in yellow basically are the changes, just to highlight um, what Bill was saying, how the rate has now based on 780 million, the rate has decreased to 0.91271, which is a 7.44% decrease from last year. And the effect to the homeowner, as he noted, um, with that but roughly $320,000 market value home is a, like a $10 savings over last year. So just another kind of presentation um, based on what you've seen at the, the previous meeting with updated numbers now. 
Okay. Um, in the transmittal letter, just a couple other things to point out. Um, the five-year forecast that we presented to the Finance Advisory Committee is there, and uh, members of the council, that's on page 10 in the transmittal letter, and it, it gives you an idea of where we've been, and then on page 11, uh, where we may be in terms of overall fund balance in the general fund. And the general fund is important for many reasons. One, if, for the sake of our constituents, it's, it's the one uh, fund out of 29 that uh, touches them the most. It, it funds the activities of our operations, and that's what they connect with, whether it's fire police, public works, uh, planning, uh, uh, even administration. So uh, I, I hope that uh, that has caught your eye, and uh, we intend to have more projections as you go through this. You'll see what we're looking at. Um, um, I think I, I should just sum up, because I'm usually asked at this meeting, uh, where are we? Are all the funds uh, reporting a balanced budget? And they are. So the the uh, summation of where we're going to be with uh, fund balance at the end of the year and where we'll be at the end of the coming year uh, is on page 17 for you. Each of the 29 funds is, is shown there, including the library fund, pension funds, and, uh, and everything in between, large and small. Questions? Let's move into the community we serve. This is a uh, a chapter that has been, uh, I think, improved. It's up to you to decide whether it's improved. It certainly has it changed a little bit. Uh, it's, it's the mean potatoes of, again, somebody looking on the website trying to figure out about this place called De DeKalb. It's not Georgia, it's Illinois. And what do we know about this place? So some of the, some of the uh, economic, uh, demographic, uh, questions that are often asked of a community are answered hopefully here. But we also, as you know, went through a financial planning process last winter and culminated uh, in a joint meeting with the Finance Advisory Committee to discuss the financial plan for 20, 2022, 2023, 2024. And some of those uh, comparables that we did and some, some benchmarking um, factors um, are, are replayed here. Uh, we've updated some of them as numbers have become available to us. And uh, you also see on page 18. Well, I'll let you, if you have any questions on this, we can walk through it. But um, then there's a uh, Basically, a, a presentation that hopefully the GFOA will be looking at or looking for. And I want to thank Carrie for this, who has an eye to this based on her many years of auditing experience. Um, on page 42, it says General Fund Long Range Financial Plan. So this points up some of the things left to do. And you're never done in this field, and we, we put our, our, our shovel in the ground, and now it's time to, to uh, keep going, uh, both in the general fund area, and we can do this by department, we can do it by, by uh, the overall fund. We can also do this in, in terms of capital funds and the water funds. And we intend to embark on that this year. Uh, stay tuned, we'll have some kind of a description of, of what uh, might work, and we'll take that to the council hopefully in the first quarter or so. Uh, the audit starts in earnest right after the first of the year, but uh, Barry's, uh, Kerry, and others in finance uh, by the end of the first quarter into the, in the second quarter is, is, is uh, uh, a lot of work related to that. Third quarter, all of a sudden, right after uh, J July 1st and the presentation here of the audit, uh, we're right away into the budget process, so I think the time to do is in the first two quarters, and that's what we hope to do. 
But maybe even bigger than this, we need to do something we haven't done in five years, and that's a, that's a strategic plan. The one that we have expires in 2025. But if you've still got it and you've looked at it recently, you won't recognize where we are today compared to where we thought we'd be. Five-year plans in this current planning environment, if you're in municipal government, are, are not uh, typically real accurate after about the second year. Uh, like who, who uh, <laughs> there's nothing in a plan about COVID. There's nothing in a plan about the recession we're in uh, uh, or the strong recovery from COVID for that matter. So, and we're gonna have some more of that. And we're still fighting uh, with a structural problem, which we've talked about, I'm not gonna belabor tonight, but we talked about the downstate pension challenges that we have. And in the transmittal letter, you can see a little more detail than you saw at the Finance Advisory Committee meeting in mid-October. Uh, uh, but it's basically the same challenge for us, and that is to work with uh, other <coughs> municipalities, work with the Illinois Municipal League, uh, the uh, Association of Firefighters of Illinois, uh, the state legislature, our, our legislators, to come up with a, a better uh, way of, of calculating the, the, the risk and the, the obligations. And uh, there are models out there, and we hope to engage the legislature uh, on that topic uh, very soon. Before we move on to section three, I think this was maybe the page you were looking for, Bill. Yeah. I just wanted to call attention to, on page 27 and yeah. 28, this really kind of hammers home the efforts that yeah. the city has made in regards to the tax rates and the efforts as far as getting information to the other taxing bodies um, and collectively what has been accomplished over the last seven years or so. If you look at the top of page 27, there's a little um, chart there showing since 2015 the dramatic drop in overall tax rates that um, both the city and the other taxing bodies have achieved. And you can kind of see in that um, the table right below it just the exact rates from the last three years and where how we've dropped. And then on page 28, this is then the push for the future. So between 22's tax rate, 23 and 24, where the city had um, targeted to be um, with the, the choices that we've been making and getting that overall rate down even further to that kind of 9.6, 9.5% range. So I think you may have been, you yeah, that's what I was that. looking for. I, yeah. I went right over it. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, when we were at $13.25 a hundred EAV, uh, our competitors, uh, Geneva, St. Charles, North Aurora, Batavia, da, 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 Sycamore, uh, were all somewhere around seven and a half, eight. So there is a little bit of this convergence happening. What we don't, what, what we don't mind doing is getting at least to that break point or a little bit lower. But um, we have no way of knowing if they're going to come up dramatically or, or just kind of very easily. And as long as there is a gap, we are at a disadvantage not only in providing incentives to people because we have to give a large part of what we'd love to be able to control and keep in the way of property tax away. And right now, we can't afford to give anything away because we're putting it all in some other place in operation. So, okay. Uh, section three is, is remodeled. This is the, uh, the cabin that's now a palace. Well, it's not quite a palace, <laughs> but it's, it's looking a lot better and it's, and it's something that uh, in our annual review by the GFOA, it's something that they have been harping on and looking at, I shouldn't say harping on, but have been identifying as an area that we really have to, have to change. And so uh, if you want to know not only about our, our budget process, but if you want to understand our fund structure, and uh, if you go over to page 54, those of you who have taken the time to read through our annual audit, are familiar with pages that look like this. Here's the advantage, which I absolutely love. If you looked in that audit, for the most part, you won't see these categories laid out like this, which, by the way, align with how we lay out our categories and have traditionally for many years in our budget. You'll see uh, some mixing, you know, there's, there's uh, uh, going to be uh, this or that fund explanation and 
you have to go back and forth to find out where we are and how we compared with previous years. This should help any reader understand uh, where our principal funds are in terms of revenues and expenditures and do it by categories that if you wanted to go further back Can you keep into, calling out page numbers as you skip around? Uh, yeah. uh, so you start on page 54 and you're going to go through 60 and then uh, a, a spritz up in the, the, the high charts that we're used to seeing. Uh, these have a little more detail and a, and a little easier way of reading what the slices all are. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that's helpful to you. So just to elaborate on that, 54 to 57 is each individual fund of the city one year. So just the annual 2023 budgeted amounts, revenue, expenditures, and then the changes in fund balance. The other schedule on pages 58 through 60 is a three-year presentation that's required by GFOA for the city's major funds. So the city's major funds includes the general, the transportation, TIF-1, the water, three funds together, and the airport. So each of those on an individual basis shows three years worth of trend data and then all the other aggregated non-major funds are presented in total on page 60. So it's just kind of a different way of, um, of presentation. Okay, questions? Okay, section four. Now we're getting to uh, general fund detail. And if you see on page 64 and in uh, the pages that follow, uh, the next four or five pages, uh, you'll see a, a progression which we haven't, you'd have to read through a number of budgets to get this presented as crisply as it is now. And I think that's useful uh, in terms of our essential uh, revenue streams for the general fund. Uh, also, as uh, you go further and then you get into uh, some traditional uh, um, uh, data pages on, on 70 and 71, as you get into the expenditures and you get to page 73 and 74 and following, uh, you see the same kind of charting in terms of our major categories of expense. So hopefully that shows you know, what's our trend line, or are we breaking trend, or, or uh, and what are the factors behind that? And hopefully the narrative ex is explanatory and walks you through that. Also on page 79 we see a little bit of a progression in terms of the spending by department, both in the current fiscal year and in what we project for the next fiscal year and what the changes are. Uh, one thing that, that you already are aware of, and we talked to the Finance Advisory Committee about this, we've talked to the Council about it, and that is that we have consciously and purposefully uh, sought to increase our, you know, this year and next year and last year in public safety, our, our personnel, uh, for different reasons. Uh, in, in public works, uh, we had uh, in the 2000s and 2010s, uh, not refilled a lot of positions. So we were to a point where uh, we didn't have enough people to hop in the uh, plow trucks that uh, we needed on a regular basis. We, we, Andy and his crews have for a long time had the town divided up into what seemed to be the most uh, expeditious way to get things cleaned and, and, and as fast as possible, starting with the arterials and working down from there. Uh, we've, we've filled that but not extravagantly. We've hired uh, three in the last four years. Uh, one projected for next year, one of those three. In uh, fire, last year was the, the big year in the first part of this year. We got the SAFER grant, uh, which was a three-year grant, and uh, that and uh, what we've been able to, to uh, do with uh, you know, savings and the ARPA money helped us not only refill the boot, uh, which was down about four and a half million dollars in losses from COVID, uh, but uh, to, to be uh, stable again uh, above and, and beyond. We've filled frozen positions now. And then we did one other thing that we had to do. It was mandatory we had to do it. We got ahead of the game by a year. 
and that was to create, go from what was something that I have to admit I had my hand in in the 90s when we didn't have money and we did this two and two. And you've heard me talk about this before. Two on an engine, two on an ambulance. Theoretically, every time there was a fire call, the ambulance and the engine showed up at the same, same time and you had four people on the fire ground, correct me if I'm wrong here, theoretically start dragging holes and so forth. But what if, and this has happened so often, and it's happened as, as our calls increase, uh, where we, we're becoming kind of the first line uh, medical service for a lot of our residents now. Uh, what if that ambulance is not trailing, so the engine gets there with two, you can't fight a fire with two. Even if you wanted to, you can't. You gotta have somebody, you gotta have an engineer, and we don't send, I guess to save a life, somebody's hanging from a window, we'd send one person in with that inch and a half hose or two inch hose. But it's not effective. And if you have multi, uh, traffic w uh, accident with three ambulances on the scene, then we're really, it's gonna be a, instead of a five minute response, it's gonna be a 10 minute response for the worst. We talked about this at length for three or four months in the fall of 20 and into 21. And before there was ARPA, and before there was um, the, the safer grant, uh, the council and this, with my strong recommendation decided, we, we've gotta change this. And the NFPA and uh, others were pressing on us to do just that. So we did that, and now they're, they're on full time now, and that adds, of course, to our bottom line. Police department, uh, Jason, correct me if I'm wrong here. So uh, with the strong urging of the council, we have been trying to get to a threshold of 70 officers, sworn officers, that includes Jason, the command staff, the chief, uh, and then uh, the sergeants and the patrol officers. And uh, we uh, take a couple steps forward, one back, just because we've had a, a, a lot of retirements. We've had, uh, uh, it's, it's not been so easy getting people on a hiring list, so sometimes we have to wait an inordinate amount of time. So just when we think we're making progress and somebody retires and we can't fill that because we don't have a list that's current anymore. You start going down a list and people don't respond, or they say, I've, I've had a job for three months in someplace else. So uh, we're gonna get to 70 this year, that's in this budget. Uh, also in this budget is a two and a half percent wage increase pretty much across the board. That's what was in the contracts. It's, uh, everybody knows the environment we're in. People are taking a hit right now in terms of uh, household incomes and we thought that was that was appropriate. Um, where are we a year from now, two years from now? That's, we do more planning on that and we like to get ahead of that, uh, but that's where we are. That's why the budget has a pretty darn big bump here. And of course that has pension implications, there's no doubt about it, so we have to also set aside more, as we hire more people, we have a higher pension obligation. Those are the main trends in the general fund this year. Uh, that and trying to do something about the uh, increasing obligation for the downstate fire and police pensions. Questions? Okay, uh, you can see each department portrayed in section four. Uh, we have organizational charts for each. Uh, some pictures, some um, Description, each, each department has uh, the, uh, the principal achievements of the current year and the principal uh, objectives of FY23. So, uh, if, unless you want me to stop, just keep going. Section five, let's move from the general fund to uh, our special funds. And so you want to go to page 156. Yeah, 157. 156. Okay. Yeah. So there are quite a few special funds here. This is uh, uh, a, a breakout of, of the funds that uh, have uh, a special, uh, sometimes a statutory, uh, guideline which uh, created them and also defines their use. 
and uh, we, we've got uh, the American Rescue Plan Act, the GEM-T fund, which currently is getting monies, you've heard this before, uh, for Medicaid pa patients only that pay, it comes from the federal government, pays the gap between what we're able to charge, which might be $130 per call, for our actual out-of-pocket costs, which is upward to $2,000. That's if there are no extras, no extraordinary picking somebody up or transporting that person. And en route, we're not doing uh, uh, extraordinary uh, medical procedures to keep a person breathing and so forth. Uh, and uh, this doesn't include going beyond, uh, you know, the delivery of the patient. So uh, that money, most all of that gap now is coming to us through this GEMT fund or uh, program. And we parked that in a unique fund uh, that is now our source of capital for the really big ticket fire department equipment and, and vehicle costs, which otherwise just get on lists and don't. And, and for many, many years, just couldn't be afforded. Replacing a fire engine, replacing an ambulance, replacing our breathing apparatus. And all these things have a life uh, like, you know, other vehicles and equipment, but in our case, in order to remain certified, we have to, we have to hold to those, and one of those is, you know, if the NFPA, the National Fire Protection Agency, says that we've, we're past the useful life, we're past the useful life. We are right within a year on the breathing apparatus and the machine that creates the oxygen that fills the bottles, and we decided we had to do that. Jim T, thank you, is paying for that. We have two fire engines this year that uh, we have set aside the money for. We received one, we received one in 2023, and it will come out of 2023. And there's another large item on the agenda for uh, Monday, uh, a large, a large uh, vehicle that uh, otherwise could not have been uh, afforded at this time. So that's very valuable to us. I wish we had that for all of our departments. We don't. Um, for the fire department. <laughs> uh, transportation fund, uh, let's just take a minute and look at that. Uh, so the, the transportation fund, we don't talk a lot about this. The council sees uh, from time to time reports that uh, will uh, be focused on a particular item, like recently it was the, the transit center. If you go to page 161 and uh, the several pages that follow, this is a, a highly subsidized fund. The federal government pays most of the money uh, into this fund. We have a local match from the NIU uh, for, the, for a contribution from NIU. Uh, those two together are it's about six million for the state of Illinois, which they, they get money from the federal government, two million for the local match from NIU for the buses that principally carry students from place to place on campus. There are some other operating assistance grants. There are some uh, special grants. Uh, the biggest uh, so far has been the, uh, the grants for our transit center, uh, $6.5 million for that, and then some other smaller grants. Uh, uh, very little in the way of actual fair revenue. Just doesn't pay much, you know, 50, 60 grants, something like that a year. Uh, so the allocation in uh, the FY23 is going to be somewhere around 17 million. And a lot of that goes toward the planning and design for the transit center that we've talked about here. And just to further elaborate on that, the fund actually is, is in balance between revenues and expenditures. So all of the operations of that fund are going to come out of, like Bill said, either a federal or a state grant or a little bit of the NIU's contribution. So it's a, it's a net change of zero overall. Yeah. Okay, uh, special service areas, we've talked about those uh, here before. Uh, there, there's not a large amount of spending that comes out of them, but there are two in particular that, that I think have been uh, important and timed. Uh, the Market Square Special Service Area, just this year we saw the repaving of many of the commercial lanes in, in that large commercial subdivision, and uh, I'm glad that we were able to, to get that done. 
Uh, Hunter Ridgebrook, there's money there to help uh, with the uh, new ownership and management of uh, that particular complex, the very large complex that uh, needed a lot of work and still does. So uh, there is some money there to be used for the exterior of that complex. And after the SSAs, we go th to the TIF uh, funds. We uh, replayed uh, the number one, the TIF number one fund just uh, last year. We, for all intents and purposes, uh, terminated the fund. We kept just under $20,000 uh, uh, in that fund, so we kept the fund open in case there were tax appeal rulings that uh, came out here in the last year. There haven't been any. We're not aware of any uh, coming up, but we're, we're going through one more appeal uh, season, and at the end of January, we should know where we stand. If there's nothing, then that money gets ported over to TIF 3, uh, where it can be put to use uh, to council's pleasure going forward. TIF 3 is uh, just a fraction of what TIF 1 was in terms of annual income and geographic area, but it's been pretty productive in terms of uh, small uh, grants up to, up to 25,000, uh, oftentimes they're less than that for facades, for some uh, uh, repairs to make front doors and bathrooms accessible, some electrical, some plumbing, some emergency roof repairs and, and the like. And that's principally a, a downtown geographic area Although the west side is, is bounded roughly by the, the Kishwaukee River Bridge at the lagoon, uh, two blocks either side going east until you get to 7th Street and then it kind of filters out. So it's not a very long TIF and it just follows Lincoln Highway. We call that the downtown TIF 3. Uh, so we had a few projects. Uh, we have, at this point, uh, we meet quarterly with all the other local taxing bodies that contribute to that TIF, which is unusual in this state. Usually it's an annual meeting, but we went through heck and back in 2019 and 2020 for the sins of others, and, and we are now at a point where we have very good communication. Everything is, is immensely um, transparent in terms of finances, and uh, we're, we're pleased with where we are. Uh, will it be as productive as you like? Probably not, but uh, and there are areas that uh, we don't have any more under a TIF regimen, like uh, uh, where DIMCO is, uh, where uh, the northeast uh, quadrant from 7th, uh, north of Lincoln Highway and east of 7th Street all the way to Peace Road. That was, that was to be the heart of our t tax increment district going back to 1986. It needs a lot of work still. We've got the GE plant, and there's a new ownership there. And, uh, so uh, we'll do what we can. Also, the airport was in our TIF-1. This has crimped our ability to make more rapid progress towards some improvements at the airport, but we're, we're just going to keep doing it. So. All right. Any questions about, uh, we have a CDBG fund, a uh, Community Development Block Grant Fund. That's on pages 181 and 182. It's been very helpful in, in uh, supporting underserved residents uh, within our community. Uh, it's a federally funded program. We got this year somewhere around, well, there was some surplus money, so we got a fresh contribution of about a little over 500,000, and we had some carryover funds from a previous year. You're allowed to carry over for a couple years if you're on the track toward a purpose that uh, is defined under HUD rules, and uh, a lot of that has to be spent by the end of 23. So roughly on an annual basis, about a half a million dollars is what comes through here. For since, since you just mentioned it, the mayor's, uh, uh, Northern Illinois Mayor's Association I was just at, um, they said the CDBG went from 550000 up to $1.5 million now we can apply for. I don't know if that was, we're aware of that at this point. I'm assuming Joanne's all over it, but, and you're yeah, all over it. Yeah, uh, we uh, actually, you're going through another, every, every year uh, this time we're putting together a, a proposal, a package for the council which hits you in January. It's this year going to be a new four-year plan and a 
one year plan for FY23. So you'll, you'll have lots to dig into and take a look at. Hopefully by then we'll know for sure where we are uh, with the federal funding. Um, I, we had a considerable amount of extra funding during the COVID pandemic, uh, but we haven't seen that since. Housing Rehab Fund is, uh, by now, uh, which it could have been rolled into something else with CDBG or something like, like that, but uh, uh, the monies in here were set up uh, through another federal program, the Community Development Assistance Program, CDAP. Maybe some of you have worked with that in the past. It's a program that did a lot of uh, property rehab and for low to uh, moderate income families. Uh, not just insulation, but uh, major uh, rehabbing and remodeling. Uh, that program from the federal government ended uh, in the late 80s, but the monies that were used in a revolving loan program uh, that have piecemeal come back to us over the long-term loans uh, can't be used for anything else but that same purpose. So. Uh, there's, there's some money, about 70 grand in here. We can't just say, let's put that into some other useful purpose. Uh, it has to stay there and be used for the same purpose. Uh, it has been used for some demolitions when there is a, a, maybe a house fire that uh, uh, had, had devastated a small home somewhere and it would, it would otherwise uh, comply, but uh, that's been a few years since we were able to do that. Questions? Section six, uh, debt service fund. Thanks. This is a. I thought this is the most fun thing that. One of the most fun things that Kerry added to the budget this year. Uh, on page one eighty eight. If you can make debt fun, right? <laughs> well, if you can make it fun. Yeah. Seeing so, it go down is fun. Oh well, yeah. Uh, I really but like the little check box. It's a good. <laughs> it's a good view. Using the fiber, uh, we just show five categories that, because we're a home rule community, we're not bound by some of the same criteria that other communities are in terms of what your legal debt margin might be. Uh, but here we, we show, we break it down. Uh, we're looking really good. It's not only that we're not anywhere near the maximum limits, but we're coming down. And uh, at the end of the next eight to 10 years, we're, we'll be debt free. Uh, and I dare say until we solve our property tax issue with the state uh, and the non-state pensions, we're not going to be in a very good position to borrow money uh, with a, a general obligation bond with our full faith and credit tied up into property tax. It's just not, not in the cards. So um, when, we, when it is time, man, we'll be ready to go. <laughs> so just to expand on that, what is in this particular um, area of the budget is excerpted from the actual debt service policy that the city adopted. So out of the financial policies, these are the metrics that the city has determined are important to follow. So this is just highlighting that these are the things that the city has imposed upon itself for debt um, compliance. And in fact, the city is actually in compliance with all of them. So it's kind of giving ourselves credit for the work that we've, uh, that we've done in that, that area. Awesome. At a glance, you can see what the remaining debt service is on page 190, each of the outstanding bonds that we have. And uh, those two schedules, they're the same debt. The first one shows by actual bond issuance um, when they mature. The 2010C is about to drop off on January 1st. That's the final payment. The 2013A in 22, 2022, those are both related to the library bonds. So if you recall, the 2013A was refunded earlier this year by the 2022 bonds to achieve a, a cost savings in the, at that time, the better interest rate environment. There's still two payments remaining on the 2013 because it made more financial sense to pay those directly rather than refund those. That's why you kind of see both of those issues for the next couple of years. And then on the bottom, um, same debt just shows which funds are repaying that debt. So out of the general fund, that's where the library bond money is coming from, straight out of the general fund. And then everything else comes out of the debt service fund. And because the city abates the property tax levies on the, that debt every year, it actually gets funded by a transfer in from the general fund. 
jobs. So ultimately, the general fund is paying for all of it. Let's jump to Section 7, the capital project funds. We've talked about these a uh, couple times. So we did it in August. We did it again in, in uh, October. Uh, not anything really significant has changed. We've, we've portrayed uh, the, in terms of revenue, uh, where the principal sources are, recurring sources are, I should say. And we're, we're getting by, but this is another, I would consider it a structural issue, where we are every year challenged by the, lo the increasing and, and um, growing list of both uh, vehicle, funding needs and uh, street uh, repair and improvement needs. And we had some conversation about this about nine months ago when we did our financial plan. Uh, the plan is at this point to have about $2.6 million dedicated for street maintenance. So let's talk about streets for now. For about 25 years uh, until 2020, uh, we were spending uh, uh, about eight hundred and twenty-five, eight hundred fifty thousand dollars. So on average, uh, some higher years, some not. Uh, but uh, we have to do better because just to keep a a very modest. Uh, but there's a scale of eight in the uh, payment index uh, that we have been following, which other communities follow, engineers, city engineers follow. Uh, Zach's not here tonight. He had to be someplace else, but. Um, it, we're at number eight, which is not the top, it's the bottom. Uh, 2.6 million puts us comfortably there. We'd rather be around five, but to do that we have to come up with another million dollars. Now, we've uh, incrementally been increasing. We, we, in 2019, the, the council uh, did add some more uh, local fuel tax uh, to the, the pot. Uh, but this is not the best time to be increasing that, certainly. So uh, no help there on the horizon. When it comes to vehicles, the uh, cannabis tax returns or uh, revenue that we hope to get in 2023 will help. Uh, but here it is, uh, late November. Uh, are we gonna get 200,000? We don't know. Or we might get two, and then maybe that's a safer bet. Uh, we're working hard on it, but uh, they're moving it. There are two interested parties. One in particular that's moving along has an architect involved and an engineer. And we're making some progress, but uh, and, and has a contract on a on a parcel in our downtown area, not the Lincoln Highway uh, corridor, but uh, on Locust Street. So we're we're hoping that will help. Uh, there's also the possibility of some other. There's another federal pot out there that. Uh, uh, we're not, there isn't much conversation about, but there was a, what? Oh, pot, no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Couldn't resist, sorry. Yeah, that's good. Need a little levity during There audience. might be, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll speed up here. Uh, but anyway, we've talked about that. I'm not going to belabor that. Let's move into the water fund. Let's talk about our enterprise funds. Before we get yes. to the water fund, yes. I want to give you guys a, a compliment. I thought the presentation you made about the road conditions and taking care of the roads that was in the transmittal letter on page Good. 13 and 14, that was excellent. Thank you. Well, I was hoping that the public would see that because we get a lot of calls all year round. When are you going to come and do my street? Well, it's bad. We'd love to do it, but have you seen, you know, that doesn't sell. Uh, nobody wants to hear that. You know, not mine. Is, so uh, we can fall back on that. Now we're going to do that. Uh, we're, we're getting some help to re revise our pavement condition index uh, uh, charting, but uh, we need some grant money for that. The the local metropolitan authority for for that kind of funding. Our DSATs is the is the acronym for it, uh, is going to be paying for that, and we're assured that'll happen in 23. It was supposed to happen in 22, but the money didn't come from the state sources. Water fund, uh, I, kudos and compliments again to some far-thinking council members, FAC members back in 2016, 2017, for seeing that uh, 
Well, you know, streets are crumbling and other things are going, but we have uh, user fees, water fees, which are holding their own. Uh, the, uh, the demand was at that point pretty stable and the, and the revenue uh, was, was sufficient to carve out the, some part of, the, of an annual increase. And so uh, a courageous move is taken to say, well, your, your water bill is going to go up a little bit for the next four years. And since then, it's gone up a little bit, and it does every year. And uh, it's pegged to inflation now, although the council has the ability, and this goes back to a year ago, to have a conversation about it. It's not an automatic thing. It doesn't all, all of a sudden end up on a bill uh, because of some administrative work. Uh, and this year, we did actually back up. So we went to 3.5% instead of, at the time, it would have been 8%, which would have been uh, burdensome for many of our families in our community and businesses too. But uh, so that carve out is paying for uh, some substantial infrastructure improvements on the water side. And uh, we're, we're better for it. Uh, it's easy to, at this juncture to look back and say, boy, that, that was great. Uh, I, it, it didn't come without some uh, angst and, and sweat, I'm sure, at the time, but uh, thank you for that. I think the pages you're referencing, Bill, are 210 and 211. Yep. 210 yep. shows the year-over-year -year increase in that the rate and what amount was going into the operations fund versus the water capital fund. And then on 211, it goes through kind of a detail of what projects were completed with that revenue and what tentative projects in 23 will be completed. Big ticket items are always the wells and towers and such, but there's every year uh, a certain amount of uh, underground. Uh, if you were driving around this weekend in the city of DeKalb, you would have seen uh, three, main, three main breaks, I think. Uh, and we have a terrific small, but terrific and very responsive team of three or four that just show up. And as soon as there's the police department gets a call about water running down the street and they go out and investigate it, they're all over it. So uh, uh, can't ask for more from, from the water department in that respect. Uh, airport fund uh, is also an enterprise fund. Uh, some nice pictures here of big jets. Uh, we don't get them every day. They guzzle gas, which is good. Uh, we're working uh, uh, with our airport manager, with the airport advisory board, and the council to uh, augment the revenues. Uh, we are, a lot of our, our uh, tea hanger leases have, have not been uh, upgraded in a lot of years, so we have a, a, a working group of some pilots, some of our local pilots, and some of our staff uh, who are in uh, all of my favor who are working out uh, uh, some uh, changes in leases that will be modest but will make us competitive, not more than competitive. Uh, and uh, next year, hopefully, the solar field is, is uh, up and running and, and uh, that will generate about 82,000 more per year that we're not seeing now. And we have to be aggressive in marketing ourselves, too. We're considering uh, some uh, splashy, hopefully successful uh, consumer-driven uh, uh, activities at the airport. Uh, uh, there's more to, more to follow. Uh, some some uh, unique activity that will bring in crowds. And it's not, we're not talking about air shows. So, uh, it's an understatement. We'll, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be great, though. Yeah. So, uh, refuse and recycling fund. That uh, basically, as you can see on page 218, that is, uh, you know, basically a wash. Uh, we 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 plan to balance uh, the uh, spending with uh, almost to the penny the revenues that come in, uh, and. Uh, we're, it, it's, it's a good value considering what uh, is involved here uh, and that none of us want to do it. So uh, 
we, we pay people at a pretty good price, uh, pretty good meaning pretty economical price to come in and do that, refuse removal and recycling for us. Internal Service Fund, Section 9, which starts on page 219, our comp and health insurance fund. Today, uh, a little late in the game, but we got our uh, uh, renewal notice, and uh, you haven't seen it yet. Uh, but uh, we're going to look at it. We're going to pair it out. Uh, it's a little bit more than what we thought. There's two types of uh, cost increases that we, we're looking at on the liability insurance side. Uh, one is cyber insurance, which has gone up uh, dramatically in the marketplace, and uh, it's at least half again as much as we've been paying for a number of years. And uh, also, we, we did something, and Andy Rye was very helpful in this. Uh, for a lot of years, we had a structure of, of insuring our buildings uh, less than our, what was it, Michelle, less than our... our yeah, over. so they hadn't gone up, and, uh, and we weren't even, we weren't anywhere near what the market values were for, and, and we weren't looking for replacement value. So we, we, you know, just uh, so there are some things that could burn down and we'd walk away, but most things are precious enough to us, particularly in terms of operations, that they have to be well insured because we're the only police. Force in town and fire force and uh, firefighters in town and public works in town, so we have to have a, a home, homes. So uh, we we were going to have to up up the uh, annual payment for those services, but uh, we'll we're not talking about hundreds of thousands over, but we're talking about ten thousand, twenty thousand maybe that we didn't anticipate in here. But we're going to go back and forth with the the, uh, the rep was in today, and we'll see where we are. Correct? Is that fair to say? And to just elaborate a little bit more, if the for your benefit, the way the internal service funds are set up is that they're paying premiums for those um, health insurance and for workers' cap and liability, and they're being funded by other funds, essentially. So the general fund kicks money in, water fund, airport fund, and transportation. That's where the revenues come from. So there's a couple charts on page 220 and 221, which just show Here's the outgoing expenses out of the funds, and here's the incoming um, revenue to these internal service funds that offset that. And one of the items in the city's fund balance policy is to maintain certain levels of reserves in these two funds. So for the workers' comp and liability insurance fund, there's a target of a million dollar um, reserve balance, which the way this is designed to go at the end of 2023, it's going to be 1,010,000. So we're right there at that number. And then on the, uh, conversely, on the health insurance fund, the policy is to maintain about one month of health insurance premiums through our um, IPBC. It's the health insurance cooperative we're part of. And that equates to about 500,000. So at the end of 2023, we're targeting to be about 597. So we're, we're at meeting both of those um, fund balance metrics for those funds. Okay, finally, one thing that uh, you will see uh, when you visit this a week from now. Uh, there's an appendix every year. We have our financial policies, our performance measures, our glossary, oh, and our chart of accounts. Pension funds at all. Oh, yeah, I guess. Well, yeah, I skipped over police and fire pension. Do you want to talk about that again? I'm happy to. I mean the crushing obligation? Yeah. That one. I'm going to end on that note. That's three <laughs> words. Yeah. Has it changed? Is it getting better? No. No. <laughs> no. I think we're fluent. No. No, I wish it's not. 1.7 this year is the, 1.7 million is the gap. Last year was under 1.4. Next year, probably 2.1 million. That's beyond every dollar that we get from property tax. And by the way, when you get your bill in the spring, you'll see you got those two lines, one that says pensions, and the top one just says, you know, general. And for the last two years, I've been, I get calls for a week. You guys forgot to raise taxes for your operations. No, we didn't. It's just we don't do anything for general operations. It all goes into pensions. So and we're alone in that as you look up and down that, that list. Oh, okay. Is there anything else you wanted to say about pensions? No. Thank you for Unless anybody has a question. All right. So I was just starting to say the reason the appendix is, is not here. So the chart of accounts hasn't changed much. We're 
this is always the last thing we do. Uh, the financial policies have not changed in any substantive way, but a uh, new set of eyes here came in and saw, wait a minute, we don't even have that, that fund anymore. Um, uh, little details, and uh, we try to be sound in our details. Uh, uh, we used to do, the, our, our annual financial report used to be called the CAPR, that's what we called it. Now it's called the ACFER. Uh, the yeah annual the annual comprehensive, comprehensive financial report instead of the comprehensive annual financial report. Uh, so it's much clearer uh, now. What's that? It's much clearer now. I, I think so. So little things like that. Uh, I wanted to get them in for tonight, but uh, we we just oh, and performance measures is the only thing really that we're. Uh, and I'm glad we're taking the time to do this. Uh, it just wasn't ready for prime time tonight, it'll be done. We'll send them to you so you can see. Okay. They're very close. More or less done. But they, they couldn't go out last Thursday. Sorry. I thought this wasn't in the cards. So that's where we are. Uh, you know, a couple hundred million dollars under your charge. A uh, good part of that. Uh, and the first hundred million is the pension fund. Fiduciary uh, responsibilities. So. Finance, council, questions, comments. Tom, a couple comments. Um, I think first of all, from an overall perspective, um, it's, a, it's a major step. Documentation, the write up quality, the review. Uh, we have policies, many of which were adopted through the FF, uh, through the Finance and Budget, and written, um, drafted really from other communities when we, we cut and paste and decided we needed some policies that could put some structure around our financial condition. Our goal of 25% fund balance, really basic things. A debt policy that made some sense. Um, and it's uh, refreshing to see someone test it against those constraints that were adopted. Pretty basic stuff that we don't often talk about over the years of more serious problems, I guess. Uh, but a real step forward and kudos to uh, addition and finance. Real positive stuff. Um, from an overall perspective, um, my comments would really go back to page 11. And if you go back to page 11 and look at the five-year forecast, that's, to me, a, another major step forward. We wanted to talk about sensitivity. We wanted to talk about what impacts our decisions have long range. And you can see trend overall, uh, but for our federal funds, we'd be in deficit this, and this year uh, and every year going forward. We have a nice fund balance to work off, and some of that could be applied to capital needs if necessary. Um, so uh, again, just uh, to be well aware in, in your consideration on a go forward basis. If there is a recession, and you look back over the history, look at years where recessions occurred, revenue streams were impacted in the neighborhoods of 5 to 10 percent. So you have variable revenues from the state, state income tax, sales tax, those portions of your revenue streams that are variable um, can drop 5 to 10 percent. So that's roughly 30 million of your revenue stream, 5 percent is a million and a half. If you lose a million and a half in revenue streams due, due to a recession in the next 12 months, you want to be just aware of that as to what the implications are. You can look at the history and see that we've, we've actually had to go through this. So having a good fund balance is certainly a positive to being able to address that. And I know uh, my own personal feelings are that the, fine, uh, the revenue streams are pretty conservative in, in longer range plans. But uh, if a recession comes, it, it, it could be less than that. 
Um, as to the tax levy, we talked in general about a do uh, recommendation. We've never done anything formally, but uh, the percentage of new construction uh, was, it, was at about 4%, and the, and the original tax levy increase was about 4%, and that all made sense to me. Now we're looking at 5.7% um, and the increase in the EAD at 780 million, so that's about 5.7% 5, 5 coming from new construction, and that would be available to you with absolutely no impact to the homeowner. Right. So uh, on a go forward basis, I think that's something we're thinking about or, and or adopting. As, uh, you want to keep your rates going down and the homeowner whole. Other Tom, that, can I ask you a question? Yeah. I don't know how you can say that. Because if you look at what I handed out, this was where we were when we met in October. So we were 4% time. Right. And uh, uh, so, uh, or I should say, this is where we are in, the, in terms of where, we, right. where right. we're recommending now. Uh, and we were a little higher. We were about 9, 0.923, something like that. But I took your suggestion, and that second page, the inside page, shows where we'd be if we just flatlined at 0.98612. Uh, and you're going to pay more tax. Yeah, I don't I know how to this, calculate any I saw way. that number uh, and I would look at it. I mean, the original number was $28 million that we had. That was about 4%. Yeah. And that, that line dried up with... Yeah. You know, basically a flat situation. Well, I, I'm trying to be transparent here, and I, if you can think of another, a better way to show it, but this goes right down into the, the smallest house, uh, right, right. you know, pocketbook. Okay. That was my, my only other observation. Uh, and it's, it's great, obviously, to have the new construction there available and uh, allowing the tax the homeowner really to benefit by the 6.7%. Uh, inflation increased the value of the home went up and they're not going to pay anything for that until the rate now by that or a little more than that now. So uh, that's positive for the homeowner. So, Council? Anyone else? Yes, one more thing. city manager. Uh, so you already get this about your city manager. <laughs> I, I, I didn't come back here to balance the books. Right? I came back here because I thought DeKalb had upside. And this was long before anybody knew anything about Facebook and uh, Ferrara and the rest of that. I got tired of and, and what really prompted me to come back here was what was happening with the TIF district. I thought that was a scandal. And so did a lot of other people, by the way. Uh, and I thought, this is the place I came to in 1970. It was going to be my future. And it's been my future. It's all it's been. And I thought, we're always going to have ups and downs in the business cycle. We'll have recessions. We'll have boom periods. We've got two structural problems we talked about tonight, but the biggest one for the general fund, obviously, is the pension. But we can fix that. It can be fixed. But what we needed to do here for about three or four years was to buy time. And uh, God bless us. Uh, Facebook came into our lives, for our community lives. Nobody knew that. Nobody could take claim for, you know, say, oh, I saw that. No, nobody, could. nobody knew. But we sure tried. We just went out and banged the drum, and we got it. And one thing I think we have to know is that we can't go back on the staffing we have. That doesn't mean, and look what we did in COVID. When we had no other choices, Everybody gave back their wage increases and salary increases, and we froze positions, and we did all that stuff. But if you go back to two and two, you go back to 60 or 59 police officers. Uh, how many in street, Andy? We're impoverishing ourselves because these bad times don't last if we got willpower, creativity. And so whenever I do a budget every year, this, <laughs> this is an experience. Uh, six months of it, right? Dreadfully tired of the numbers. Uh, this last weekend, I should have been doing more prep and more homework. I, I just, I couldn't. I couldn't do it. Uh, but to me, the exciting thing about you and you, and these people in particular, 
is what we're doing to raise hope, to raise expectations, to raise a, a future. And if we can't do that, uh, it's a, like that thing I showed you the other night, we can be very successful at mediocrity. I don't want to be. I think we need to be a lot more successful at excellence and keep reaching for it. So, sorry, I had to say that because, uh, uh, I, I mean, we're going into another budget year. I don't know if I'll do another budget. I'm not making an announcement. But uh, if this is the last one, I think it's showing that we have promise, and I'm happy for it. Enough. I think part of what I'm hearing, I mean, you, this budget is still accounting for two and a half million dollars in roads. I'm just going to use rough yeah. numbers. 70 police officers, a fully staffed fire department, a fully, fully staffed street department. Sorry, Andy, I, I know you could probably argue that one. Um, <laughs> your projections are including all those yeah. expenses. That's right. And when we're faced with a real challenge in the future, we're also faced with other levers that we can pull to get leaner, reduce expenses, while the whole time being sitting on top of a brilliant fund balance um, as well. But I do believe downstate, something has to be done with the police and fire pension. Um, Bill's been going downstate to speak with them. I was just speaking with one of our state senators. Uh, I just got appointed to the IML board. That's going to be my number one thing with the IML board, is what are we going to do about police and fire pensions? This is a reality for so many other uh, municipalities that something is going to get done at the state. If they well, don't, we're much better shape than 80% of those other municipalities. Yes. Correct. Yeah. Much better shape. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, they yeah. can't even uh, with the provide capital. services but, anymore. But we could appeal, like, yeah. sorry, now we're going down, but we could appeal to our state legislative friends because eventually they have to pay for those towns that are getting, you know, uh, you can't go bankrupt in Illinois. So, you know, there are a lot of towns, central Illinois, southern Illinois, absolutely, Tom, that are yep. on the precipice. I mean, they, so now this, the state police are doing their policing and they are, I don't know what they're doing for fire departments, frankly. I don't know. But I think that's important to call out. I mean, we know it's there, we know it's a reality, and it's going to be. Uh, incredibly impactful when you look at it going forward. But we're also not just sitting here waiting for it to happen. I mean, Bill's actively be involved, I'm actively involved to figure out how we can have a voice to affect change at the state level to get them to finally wake up and make a decision um, and move that ball forward for the good of the whole entire state as well as the good of DeKalb. So we're in a, we're in a, I mean, in so many ways, a great spot. I mean, we got real challenges ahead of us. We can't take our eye off the ball. We can't keep doing a bunch of things in parallel. But boy, is it good to be in a, a situation like we are right now financially at the city of DeKalb. Uh, for me, uh, I, I, I got the budget and it's kind of like, hee, I can't wait to read it. Um, which, me reading a budget, I don't usually <laughs> think that. But what I, what I do love about what the city manager created and what our finance director, Dittman, created, the narrative. It is really cool to go through and, and read about what's going on in the fire department. And, oh yeah, that's right, I forgot, we got that new engine, that's really cool. And we brought on all those extra firefighters and we increased the safety of our, our, our men in blue? What, what, men in red? I'll call them men in red. <laughs> um, but then also you can read about the police department and oh yeah, that's right, we got the body cams and, and, and we've got new officers and I love, you can see the numbers and when I was on the Finance Advisory Commission years ago, we were literally, I think, just printed out the fund balance, handed it to us in a three-ring binder, and, okay, tell us what you want us to do. And it's like, how, how, there was no way to interpret it unless you were actively involved in city government to be able to understand it. What you all produce is something that we can read, which is going to help us make better decisions, but also the public to read from a transparency perspective. And then you did it while increasing operations, lowering taxes for uh, the individual homeowner. I mean, this, this, this document that's before us is quite frankly a work of art and I know it's years in the making especially for you Bill um, but the time and energy that all department heads put in to this as well as our finance director and the city manager can't thank you enough um, it's a great document it really helps us do our job even better so nice work thank you Bill I've been on this committee for some years and I know in the past before you came it says we get numbers and then we find out the next two are inaccurate and so I've seen a general improve, a great improvement. Actually, this is the first time I've read through this. I feel like there's a sigh of relief because there feels like there's more options and hope. And obviously, we've had some a lot of positive things happen. But I always appreciate the narrative you give us. And I was going to say thank you to you and Ruth, but it sounds like you did. Not. <laughs> 
you did the majority of this, so I appreciate it. I feel like uh, it's gone nothing, it's gotten nothing but better, so. Thank you. Yes, Alderman Larson. When I was campaigning a year or so ago, and I would knock on people's doors and ask, you know, um, anything that I could do or, you know, if you elected me. And then I always left it. I said, and I'll give you a piece of advice. Go online and read the city budget. And you could see people's faces like, why the heck would I do that? And I said, because any citizen can open this up and read exactly where DeKalb is at, and that is what is so cool. Mm -hmm. And I don't think many municipalities have that. And that was every door I rang, that was the thing I left them with, go online and read the budget. So thank you for providing that for all of the citizens, mm -hmm. not just who's here. Well said. Thank you. All right, hearing no other questions or comments, uh, we can move on to agenda item E, adjournment. All right, uh, city council adjourns first, according to secretary. All right, I take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Moved by Alderman Perkins, seconded by Alderman Verbeck. All in favor say aye. 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 Nay, same sign. City council is adjourned. Do I hear motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. I'll second. Thank you. Yeah.